About 115 years ago, Arthur Conan Doyle, in one of his stories on Sherlock Holmes, I don't know if anyone ever wondered why Sherlock Holmes has survived more than 100, and 100 years, uh, and back in the movie theaters again, uh, with all the mysteries that have been written since then and detective stories since then. Uh, the story I'm going to refer to is called Silver Blades. You have to listen carefully because you need a little intuition here. The story, Silver Blaze, is the name of a racehorse, a winning racehorse that was supposed to win a major uh, race in England at the time. And the night before the race, the horse disappeared. The horse disappeared and the trainer of the horse was found dead uh, near the stables. Now, the horse was being kept by the trainer in a place, a rural area away from the city. And the police in Scotland Yard came in to uh, inspect it. And uh, the owner of the horse, hoping that they could find the horse before the race, I guess it was two days before, not the, the day before, uh, directly came and appealed to Sherlock Holmes for help. Uh, is there anything, because he was certainly, uh, the handicap said he has the best chance of winning this race and it would be the biggest race of uh, his life. Uh, so he was desperate for help and lacked complete confidence that Scotland Yard would solve it in time. So Holmes went out there along with the inspectors from Scotland Yard and looked at all the evidence, and it was pretty much a, an open and shut case. What happened was that the horse was being kept in a barn about 100 yards from the house where the, the, the trainer and other staff kept uh, stayed. The only one who was with the horse was a stable boy and a dog. Uh, sometime the day before in the afternoon, a man, a well-dressed gentleman, came up from London and uh, uh, wanted to talk to the stable boy and the trainer to find out the condition of the horse, uh, because any presumably any information he could get might affect the handicap, uh, and this man was obviously a, a uh, an expert and somebody who was betting. Uh, when the trainer saw him, he uh, chased him away. The next morning, early morning, when the, uh, the trainer went out in the middle of the night to check the horse, and he never came back, and uh, his wife was concerned, and so early morning she went down and found that the stable boy is in a deep sleep, she couldn't even awake him from it, he was so groggy. The horse was missing, the dog was locked in the barn, and the trainer was missing. And after the police came, they went out and searched in the rounding area, and they found the trainer dead on the ground somewhere. And next to the trainer was a scarf, a colored scarf, which the stable boy and the maid who had seen this other man said had been worn by the man who came the day before. Well, the police, being very quick and prompt, found out that this man was staying in a hotel a few miles away and quickly arrested him. And on the, the evidence available concluded that he had uh, come back, stolen the horse, killed the trainer. Uh, the only question was, is what did he do with the horse? Uh, and why was he hanging around in the area if, uh, uh, if that's really what he, he did and, and enable him? And Holmes also felt that the evidence was pretty clear-cut uh, uh, against the, the man. But what did he do with the horse? Well, uh, Scotland Yard had given up thinking they must, he must have sold it. There were some gypsies on the moor. Maybe he had the gypsies carry it away or anything. They considered it a pretty hopeless case. Uh, Holmes was bothered by something. 
He granted that it was a very small detail. Actually, there were two small details that bothered him about what otherwise was a very logical and clear-cut case of circumstantial evidence. It turns out that the stable boy had been drugged. Uh, and uh, that's why the stable boy didn't wake up when the, the, the trainer's wife came and tried to wake him up in the morning. Presumably, that's why the stable boy didn't have any idea of what had happened to the horse or what had happened to the trainer, because he was dead asleep even in the morning. And they later found out that he had been drugged by opium, which had been put in his dinner the night before. And there was some question as to how the opium got into the dinner. And presumably, when the man came to steal the horse, that was just at the time the maid was coming with the man's dinner, he had leaned in the window and dropped some opium in the food. Uh, and fortunately for the thief, the food was, that was served that night was chicken curry. And because of the spice in the curry, the taste of the opium wasn't uh, apparent. And therefore, the boy ate it and slept through, and nobody knew what happened. Well, there were two things that bothered Holmes about this case. One is, by what stroke of good fortune, for the good fortune not for the trainer, but good fortune for the uh, thief and the murderer, by what stroke of good fortune was the dish served to the stable boy that night happened to be a chicken curry. Uh, because if it had been some ordinary thing, uh, probably uh, the stable boy would have known there was something funny about the food he was eating and may not have eaten it. Uh, but it was hard to figure something out. But the real turning point for Sherlock Holmes was the behavior of the dog. And he said to Watson, his partner at the time, that the real key to this whole thing is the behavior of the dog. And Watson said, what about the dog? We didn't hear anything about the dog. The dog didn't do anything. He said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. The dog didn't bark. Why didn't the dog bark? This is a watchdog. If a stranger has come in the middle of the night, if a stranger has come in the middle of the night, broken in, uh, uh, we would have expected the watchdog to bark and wake everybody up. That's what it's for. Why didn't it bark? So Holmes, having thought he has a conceptual framework, which the police certainly believed in, that was very logical, internally consistent, and satisfactory enough for the police that they were ready to, they'd already arrested this man and were ready to uh, uh, close things up, except for the fact that the horse was missing. Uh, they charged the man with murder. But Holmes said these two things were bothering him. The chicken curry and the fact that the dog didn't bark. So he began to ask, is there any conceptual system, I suppose he didn't use those terms, <laughs> but in our language, is there any conceptual system which is consistent with all the other facts we know that will also <coughs> be consistent with these two facts, the chicken curry and the dog didn't bark. And kind of like Copernicus, uh, he had to completely throw out the premises from which he had started and the circumstantial evidence and argue from a completely different point of view. And he started by saying, is there anything about these two events these two significant exceptions, these two minor details that the police just scuffed away as insignificant, is there anything that they have in common? And he said, yes, they have, two th they have something in common. If anybody had wanted to ensure that there was chicken curry that night in which to put the opium, it would have had to be somebody from the household, not the stranger coming up into town. And if there was any reason for the dog not to bark, presumably he didn't eat the chicken curry, otherwise he would have been in a coma also. Uh, it must have been somebody that the dog knew. And so he threw out the entire hypothesis 
and started, well, if it was somebody the dog knew, and it was somebody who had access to the chicken curry, who could it have been? And then he worked backward and worked on a completely different hypothesis as to why the trainer left in the middle of the night to come down to the place, why they found the, the trainer dead quite some distance from the barn, and he was hit by a blow on the head. And to make a long story short, uh, he concluded that it was the trainer who had put the opium in the chicken curry, Obviously, because the trainer came, the dog didn't bark because he knew who he was and he was, uh, belonged to him. And it was the trainer who took the horse out of the stable and was leading it away for some reason. And then the question is, who killed the trainer and what happened to the horse? And the trainer had a small knife on him, uh, a, a kind of a surgical knife. And the trainer had been cut by that knife, and there was blood on the knife and blood on the arm of the trainer. And anyway, I'll take, I won't spoil the whole story for you, but he finally concluded the trainer had, he also found out, by the way, by some bills that were in the trainer's jacket, that the trainer had a mistress in uh, London, uh, put two and two together and figured out that the trainer was actually trying to damage the horse in the tendon of the leg of the horse so that it would lose the race. And the trainer was betting against the horse. And in the act of trying to do this very delicate operation, which would not be visible to anybody from the outside, inserting a knife into the tendon of the horse, the horse kicked back and killed the trainer. And once he had this hypothesis, then what would a horse do? Uh, 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 he wasn't going to go back to the place where he came from because this is the man who had hurt him. Uh, and the horses are gregarious and maybe he has gone to the next nearby ranch where there are other horses, which happens to be the place owned by his biggest competitor who had the other horse who was going to run against him. And maybe the horse showed up there and if that, if that horse showed up there, what a godsend if uh, the horse is missing during the race, his horse would win. And sure enough, it turned out the horse was the murderer. <laughs> and the, 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 uh, uh, and he found the horse and brought him back in time for the race. Uh, the subject for us this afternoon is... <laughs> Well, there are some, uh, I, in telling this, by the way, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons, I think, that Sherlock Holmes is not just good mystery stories, but he really talk, teaches us something about thinking, not just deduction. I think, you know, uh, accusing Holmes of being good at deduction is a, a gross understatement. He has an intuitive insight into the whole, and he looks... He looks for any inconsistency in deduction. What we typically do is, is there any way we can make sense of these things? And if, it does, if there's something that's inconsistent, we try to dismiss it. If there's any tiny inconsistency, he says, then we may be completely wrong. Uh, the whole conceptual system may be flawed. It comes back in many of his... Uh, uh, and he also says, never try to... Watson is always trying to ask him, well, what's the, you've heard the evidence, what's the conclusion? He said, biggest mistake you can make is come to a conclusion before you have all the evidence. Uh, he really tries to see the totality of things way beyond what the police see. Incidentally, he showed in this story a capa and a, 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 one of his unique capacities because when he saw that knife and he deduced what it was that the trainer was going to do, and it's a very delicate operation. Uh, in, in this case, it obviously, as soon as he did it, the horse jumped because of the pain of it. He, he said, the chances are you won't go and try this operation on a horse the first time. So he asked the stable boy, uh, there was a pen of sheep uh, next to the barn. And so he asked the stable boy, by the way, I saw a pen of sheep out there. Uh, is there anything unusual that's happened among the sheep recently? 
He said, no, nothing unusual. Well, as a matter of fact, in the last three days, three of our sheep have gone lame. He had an intuition, I would call it, that the trainer would not try to do this very delicate operation on the horse for the first time. He would want to test it and see that he gets it right. And sure enough, he had tested it on three sheep in the previous days before actually trying it on the horse. So uh, in a simple way, we can say this is a man who really tries to look at the totality of the whole. And almost all the stories have that in one, the, 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 the Scotland Yard looks at the apparent evidence that stands out and tries to make sense of it and often comes to a deduction, which we do also as readers, uh, but he looks beyond that to the totality. And uh, in thinking about the story, reminds me very much about what Byers is saying about deep thinking and uh, how we come, move from one conceptual framework to another. I hope we're gonna have time this afternoon to go beyond our presentations and all of us think together, if this is what deep thinking is, if this is how we knowledge grows from one paradigm to another, what should it tell us about the way we learn or the way we teach or about our educational system? So I'm just going to briefly go through some of it we've discussed just as a summary and then make a few uh, I give out a few ideas about this process that we might call deep learning. And I'd like to clarify, we had four fascinating days on the future of education where we were talking about education in the totality. Here I'm really just talking about education of the thinking mind to move, uh, so it's a very narrow topic, but education of the thinking mind to move beyond existing paradigms. Is there anything we can do to help learn ourselves how to do this consciously, the way Holmes does. So just a few statements about deep thinking. We discussed it yesterday. Some of you were on the web with uh, Byers also. Uh, deep thinking is a creative process of changing conceptual systems. I put the word insight for that, to have the insight to go beyond what's within our system, to see something that's not there. And it was a point that uh, Marta made yesterday, or the day before, I'm not sure now, uh, that I mentioned this afternoon. Our minds, the logical mind is trained to see forms. We're trained to see what's there. This story I like so much is because Holmes saw not what was there, but what wasn't there. He didn't see that the dog behaved in a particular way or made a lot of noise, which we all would have noticed, he saw something that didn't happen. Well, if you think about your own old life, if I ask you what's the highlights of your life, what are the most memorable incidents, uh, we can all do that. Something will come to mind. But supposing we ask the question, what are the things that didn't happen in your life? You suddenly go from a finite form to infinity. Because the things that have happened are finite, but the things that haven't happened are literally infinite. Uh, so how to move from that looking for the form? When I talk, you listen to the sounds, but if there were only sound, it would only be noise. The thing that gives meaning to sound or beauty to music is that the sounds are encased, surrounded by silence. Without the silence, there's only noise. But our minds are tuned to hear the sound and to ignore or just uh, the, the sound, the silence is in the background. And that's a form of meditation is to ignore the sound and listen to the silence. That's the sounds of Simon and Garfunkel's sounds of, uh, of silence. Uh, in one of him, uh, uh, Anthony Trollope's novels, uh, uh, a, a boy, uh, Frank Gresham, has been trying to convince Mary Thorne to marry him and can't get her to speak out and agree that she will marry him and finally says, if you don't want to marry me, tell me you don't love me. Uh, she could keep quiet, but she could not 
bring herself to say she didn't love him because she really did. And so he took her silence for a confession and, uh, and, and said, then you're, we're engaged. Uh, deep thinking, according to Byers, is the capacity to move from one conceptual system to another. And it is a key to the evolution of knowledge. The evolution of knowledge involves moving from the limitations of one conceptual system, which seems to be very self-contained and consistent, going beyond it. And that's a characteristic of great discoveries. But I hasten to say, just because we move out of one conceptual system doesn't mean that we come to something new. Holmes may have become convinced that that man, the gambler, did not kill the trainer or steal the horse, but it doesn't mean that he would have solved the mystery. That requires a new conceptual system. Uh, a point that Byers makes is that deep thinking is stimulated by incompatible and contradictory elements. And in the story, the incompatible contradictory elements was why didn't the dog bark and how come uh, the, the thief was so lucky that there was chicken curry served, that they just didn't kind of make sense that things would happen just the way he wanted them. And Byers, I think, is quite weak on telling us how getting out of one conceptual system gets you into a new one, and that's a very interesting topic in itself. Uh, but he, what he does say is, the willingness to embrace apparent contradictions, apparent opposites, and hold them in view, as we discussed a couple of days ago, seems to be a basis, a catalyst for the new formulation. There are inherent obstacles to moving from one conceptual system to the other, uh, which I think many of them have been mentioned. One is, we have an inbuilt quest for certainty. And once we think we've got certainty, and this is true in all of Sherlock Holmes stories, once uh, Scotland Yard thinks that they have solved the mystery, they're extremely reluctant to consider alternative hypotheses. They're anxious to tell the newspapers the next day that Scotland Yard is already, uh, we've, we know uh, we've solved the case in record time and, uh, uh, and get the praise. Uh, there is an an inbuilt bias for facts and arguments that are consistent with our existing premises. We like to think that we're rational, but uh, it, I, I'm sure as uh, Stefan can tell and Alberto can tell, from all the studies of, uh, of scientific research, uh, there is a tendency, it's, a, it's maybe a subconscious tendency most of the time, sometimes it's conscious, but it, there's an inbuilt tendency to look for the facts that confirm what we already believe, uh, rather than those that are inconsistent with it. We simply don't see those. We ignore them. We pick out that which is consistent with our framework. Psychologically, I've used the word, uh, there's a kind of a centripetal force that keeps us within our conceptual framework. We like the security of where we are. We feel comfortable with it. And just imagine, uh, purely hypothetically, imagine a quantum physicist who suddenly comes up with a conception that uh, undermines the basic premises of quantum theory. Imagine the amount of tension he would feel <laughs> and amount of resistance that would be there, even in his own mind, let alone before he had the courage to speak it out to somebody else. It's there for us uh, all the time. We've been constantly emphasizing the implicit values and premises that we unquestionably accept, and we're not even aware, because the, the, if they're subconscious, we're not even aware that our framework is based on uh, certain premises that go unquestioned. So a few conclusions and then a, a quick list of things to think about. Deep learning. We learn by changing conceptual systems. This is Byers' approach. I don't say that's the only type of learning. That's what he calls deep learning. Deep learning is person-centered, not subject-centered. We don't deep learn by think, telling people more. We have to be aware of the, we ourselves have to be aware of what are the implicit barriers to us opening our mind and considering things in a different way. It's not the information, because you can try 
telling somebody uh, something that uh, is inconsistent with their conceptual framework, and you'll see, as we all do in uh, conferences all the time, you'll see the amazing resistance. Uh, and of course, Byers makes that point. Uh, when people from two different conceptual frameworks are arguing, uh, they feel, what's wrong with this guy? Either he's, he's uh, got ill will, or he's doing it consciously, or he must be an idiot, because he doesn't understand the simple truth of things, because we're so entrenched uh, within a framework. Uh, the point I wanted to make is that deep thinking is really only possible for a mind already capable of thinking independently. Because as long as what I can believe only that which is already accepted, all the, only that which will be endorsed by other people, uh, I don't have the, the, the personality to allow my mind to think something that's inconsistent. In fact, when uh, Copernicus uh, came up with this alternative hypothesis, he didn't want to talk about it to anybody. Because he realized, you know, this was blasphemy. Uh, and he would, he, the last thing he wanted to do was create a revolution. He just wanted to improve the calendar. So deep thinking is re relates to our personality, not just to our mind, not just to our intelligence, not just to our logical faculty. And I, I said, it, it, to really be capable of independent thinking, we need a characteristic, we had a course on this, that I call mental individuality. I, and how often are we really mental individuals that we really uh, are willing to think something that the whole world thinks is wrong? That takes a tremendous development of personality and strength on autonomy, uh, which is, we can't take it uh, for granted that this is a very common characteristic. And I argue that individually only develop, individuality only develops in an atmosphere of freedom you cannot force people, compel them uh, to de become individuals. Uh, uh, you, you can't force them to think independently. You can give them the freedom, and if you do that, you're really giving them the freedom to think very stupid things. Uh, because when you try to think independently, uh, much of what you come up with will be, a according to conventional wisdom, stupid. So how, do we have the tolerance in our educational system to encourage people to think out of the box, think for themselves, and even think uh, things that are patently foolish so that they can discover for themselves uh, the validity? Okay, so a few conclusions. Uh, I kind of listed this not just in a common sense way, what could be some of the steps? If I wanted to apply principles of deep learning to my own work or to a, a situation, uh, what, would, what should I do? Uh, first, obviously, this is not what somebody does to us. This is what we do to ourselves. First, better to understand the existing conceptual system that I'm in. Not just the conclusions or the uh, and all, but what are the real parameters of the conceptual system? Then, what is it that this conceptual system doesn't handle very well or perfectly? Are there any contradictions? Are there any inconsistencies? Is there anything that conflicts? Is there anything that's been left out? Try to think beyond the boundaries of the existing system. Try to identify the underlying values and premises which are implicit and try to make them conscious. Uh, try to escape from the gravity or the centrifugal force of the, and think, well, what can I get out of that system? Is there any perspective outside of that system? Instead of thinking this is the center of the universe, is there any other possibility of another center or another vantage point from which I could look? Then, as Byers says, embrace the tensions of uncertainty and ambiguity and contradiction rather than trying to brush them aside or avoid them. Look, if, you're in, if we're able to embrace them, is there any new perspective, alternative viewpoint from which these ambiguities and contradictions could be resolved? 
whether it makes sense or not. Is there any other explanation that would be consistent with not only what we still believe to be true, but would also be reconciled with these, which is what Holmes did? And then, uh, what would be a new conceptual system? What would be its premises? What would be its values? What would be its assumptions? What would be its boundaries? Uh, and uh, anyway, this is so. This is just my trying to take what we heard from Bayer, trying to take what we've been discussing, trying to take what Holmes is doing as an example and think, is there something, is there some methodology that we could use to encourage, to teach ourselves, to learn ourselves, and to help the educational process become much more conducive to deep learning?